So I'd like to talk to you about unconventional oil and in more particular uh, Canada's oil sands. It is, is it the panacea that Randy's asking for here or is it in fact an overstated pipe dream? Nobody showed this. This is a kind of an interesting graph that I find. The first oil well was drilled. Uh, we in Canada argue that it was drilled in Canada in southwestern Ontario in 1859. This is the cumulative consumption of oil by the human race. We've used over a trillion barrels. But the interesting thing is that, that half of that oil was used since 1984. 90% of it's been used since 1958, 10% since 2002. So we can argue about when peak oil will happen, but it's definitely coming. Forecast of growth in oil consumption in the world by the EIA, they're suggesting a a reference case of 48% growth through 2030. Colin Campbell's uh, recent forecast of, of peak oil, he feels it could peak in 2010 at somewhere less than 90 million barrels a day. But I just wanted to point out that peak will come at different times at different parts of the world and for different commodities. And the peak for non-conventional oil is forecast by Colin to be in 2030. The estimates of ultimate recoverable world oil that have been talked about already today uh, with the infamous USGS estimates uh, that were published in 2000. The mean estimate being about a trillion barrels more than most of the previous estimates. The EIA took that three trillion barrel number and came up with a scenario uh, for world oil peak. They suggested uh, Oil could peak when we've consumed half, which would be 2018 if we do have three trillion barrels. Or it could keep on growing until we hit a 10-year reserve to production ratio, at which point it falls off a cliff. And we would have consumed 82% of, of ultimate recoverable at that point in time. But it looks okay if you cut your forecast off in 2030. You don't really see the, uh, the implications. This is what uh, peaking really looks like. These are giant and supergiant fields that have peaked in the past. Pretty much the opposite of the curve that, that's proposed by the EIA. Bell-shaped peak, usually at less than half ultimate recoverable, can <clears throat> produced with a long tail, which is tertiary recovery that's been talked about earlier today. If we look at the EIA forecasts, which are based on that assumption that we can grow world oil to 82% consumed, we can see where unconventional oil fits in. Even if we grow unconventional oil by more than 500%, it's still a small piece of the total puzzle when you look at global oil demand. President Bush talked about the US being addicted to oil. Uh, he was certainly right. This is oil consumption of movements in North America. The US now imports roughly two thirds of its oil. Canada became a, an exporter of oil back in the early 80s, mainly because of the tar sands. We're number one, I guess, in terms of overall exports, but certainly not in terms of net exports. Mexico ramped up its production hugely, as well as its exports. But we've heard references to Cantarell, which is the world's second largest pool, uh, has peaked. And in essence, Matt alluded to the fact that this was very dangerous uh, for the US. It's unlikely that Mexico will be able to grow its exports much more in the future. Canada's oil production uh, from all sources, light, medium, heavy, uh, crude bitumen, we actually went down in terms of Canadian production in 2005, mainly because Suncor uh, lost an upgrader for most of the year. People talk about exports of oil from Canada. They don't talk about imports of oil into Canada. And it turns out that imports of oil, mainly into Canada's east coast, have more than tripled since 1985. And that's in direct competition with the US and everybody else that imports oil. So if you subtract net imports of oil from exports, you can see that Canada is a relatively small net exporter of oil, less than a million barrels per day. Conventional oil in Canada, uh, this is the National Energy Board forecast again. 
Forecast to peak now in the 2005-2006 time frame. But then we have the oil sands uh, held out by some as the panacea to offset declines in conventional oil. The oil sands are very different from conventional oil. Uh, it's hard to grow deliverability out of the oil sands. We need a lot of capital, time, infrastructure. We need a lot of energy uh, to get oil out of the oil sands, and we're using natural gas as that source of energy, and we looked at natural gas this morning. Expansion, if we continue using gas, expansion is limited by gas supply and gas price, unless we go to other fuels, uh, other, source, other processes. Expansion is limited by water supply. We need one to two barrels of water for each barrel of synthetic crude. Expansion may also be limited by diluents. Uh, you can't move bitumen through a pipeline on its own. You have to dilute it with a lighter oil in order to get it to move. The oil sands occupy a large portion of northern Alberta. They're almost exclusively within Alberta. Just like there's good oil, medium oil, and bad oil, there's also good oil sands medium oil sands and bad oil sands. This is the total aggregate thickness of bitumen pay. You can see that it's uh, very rich north of Fort McMurray, uh, up to greater than 50 meters of net pay. But in much of this area, it's much thinner. And uh, the recoverability in those poorer areas is up to some question. This is the surface mineable area. Uh, a huge area in northern Alberta that can be recovered by mining methods. The rest of it has to be recovered by in situ processes. Pick a number. Uh, which number do you want to use for the reserves in the oil sands? There's several computed by the Alberta Energy and Utilities Board. There is the oil remaining under development uh, where people have actually leased the land, done some economics. There's what the EUB calls the remaining established resources, and there's the ultimate potential. Prior to 2003, none of the major publications recognized oil sands as an as a oil reserve. In 2003, the Oil and Gas Journal recognized this middle number, 174 billion barrels of oil, and all of a sudden in one year, Canada became number two behind Saudi Arabia in terms of world oil reserves. BP, in my view, was a little more pragmatic. They said those 174 billion barrels is more like a resource than a reserve. It really hasn't had the economics done on it to, to justify it being called a reserve. And BP in 2004 accepted the 10.2 the billion barrel number, reserves under active development. As I'll tell you later, it doesn't really matter what number you use, that's not really the issue. The forecast, uh, there's been several of these in, over the past three years, every one getting more and more exuberant. The great white hope of a panacea for business as usual. Unfortunately, as we'll see, even the forecast can't live up to the hype. The oil sands are a complex resource requiring time, energy, capital, and other inputs to increase deliverability. So really, they don't represent a resource problem. They represent a deliverability problem. So let's look at the forecasts. Uh, back in 2003, the NEB put out two forecasts, a high case and a low case. Their high case was 3 million barrels a day in 2025. It's interesting to note that although this came out in 2003, they'd overestimated 2005 production by 33%. Their low case, 2.6 million barrels a day by 2025. In this case, they'd overestimated the 2005 production by 20%. The Alberta Energy and Utilities Board came out with a new forecast in June. They suggested 2.6 million barrels per day in 2015. Natural Resources Canada came out with a forecast in September of this year, suggesting 2.5 million barrels per day in 2015, almost the same as the Energy and Utilities Board number, and nearly 3 million barrels per day 
by 2020, and this is uh, really what Mike talked about this morning as well. The really bullish uh, people in the crowd are the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. They just put out a new number in May of 2006. They suggested 3.5 million barrels per day by 2015 and 4 million barrels per day by 2020. So if you compare the forecast, you can see that there's a, a great deal of variation, generally between 2 and 3.5 million barrels a day by 20, 2015 and as much as 4 million barrels a day by 2020. If you look at cumulative recovery forecast by those, those different forecasts, you can see how bullish they are. It took us 35 years to recover the first 5 billion barrels out of the oil sands. CAP is suggesting we can recover more than three times as much in the next 15 years. It's, it's very bullish considering what's happening with uh, infrastructure, construction, gas, and all of the other inputs. The capital cost issue. In 2004, cost overruns meant that infrastructure for mining and upgrading would cost about $78,000 per barrel per day of investment. Between 2004 and 2006, the estimated costs for 100,000 barrels a day of mining and upgrading by Shell went from $4 billion to $7.3 billion to $12.8 billion. That's $128,000 per barrel per day of investment for infrastructure. Petrocan has put its Fort Hills project on hold until 2008 at least because of cost overruns. They're estimating as much as $131,000 per barrel per day of infrastructure. In Canada, and ConocoPhillips uh, just announced a deal suggesting that the best thing to do is to export the crude out of Canada and modify refiners in the U.S. to do the upgrading. They felt that they could produce the bitumen for about $35,000 per barrel per day and export it and upgrade it somewhere else. $90 billion doesn't go as far as it used to. <laughs> I made some estimates about with $90 billion of investment, which is what is on the table right now, how much can you realistically produce? And I assume that up until 2010, the infrastructure, some of which is under construction right now, will cost an average of $78,000 per barrel per day. For in situ production, I assume that without upgrading, uh, $30,000 per barrel per day. After 2011, the higher costs kick in, $128,000 per bar barrel per day for mining and upgrading, and $40,000 for just in situ recovery of the bitumen and export. If you look at CAP's estimate, uh, 4 million barrels per day by 2020, how much money do you need to get there? Need about $220 billion. We have 90 on the table. That 90 could perhaps get us to 2.8 million barrels per day, but no further. So if you look at the, the cost estimates for the different forecasts, you can see there's not, there's not enough money on the table to get to any of them. The natural gas issue, we talked about that uh, this morning as well. Projected gas requirements in the oil sands forecast exceed the maximum supply from new projects such as the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, even without considering the declines I talked about this morning. Alternatives to natural gas have to be fast-tracked, uh, but bitumen and coal gasification as alternatives have much higher greenhouse gas outputs plus additional infrastructure implications. Nuclear has been talked about. It's a non-starter in my view because of the waste issue, uh, capital cost, time to build, risk, energy transmission to sites, and NIMBY. Premier of Alberta said it's okay if we build it in Saskatchewan but I don't want any of those nuclear plants in Alberta. <laughs> How much gas does it take uh, to recover and refine a barrel of tar sands? Uh, it depends on how you recover it. Mining and upgrading is said to be about three quarters of an MCF per barrel. Uh, 
in situ and upgrading is one and a half MCF per barrel. We looked at this this morning as well. This is Alberta's uh, forecast gas production by source. Alberta's suggesting quite a bit of that gas could come from processed gas through gasification in the tar sands. This is their forecast for gas consumption. They, they felt to get to their forecast, they needed 1.3 BCF of purchased gas and 2.4 BCF a day of, of total gas. If we put all of the forecast on the same footing using, uh, using these cost estimates, this is how it looks. The initial capacity of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline is 1.2 BCF a day. The maximum capacity is 1.9 BCF a day. In essence, we need all of that gas to go into Fort McMurray to meet the, uh, the forecasts. The diluent issue, bitumen can't be moved through a pipeline unless it's diluted with lighter oil. The premium diluent, the traditional diluents are natural gas condensates. If you use condensates, you need a one-third blend uh, to move, move the bitumen. If you use synthetic light oil, you need a one-half blend. Enbridge is looking at building a pipeline from the west coast to import light oil to Alberta, so bringing coal to Newcastle. Without diluent imports, if we were to use synthetic light as a diluent, we'd end up using 40% of the synthetic light produced in the cap forecast. This is the percentage of total production uh, that is forecast to be upgraded by the different forecasts. Uh, the Alberta government is the most bullish at about 70%, and there's a political motive here. People want the money to be spent in Alberta as opposed to exporting uh, un upgraded crude to somewhere else. CAP, on the other hand, suggests that as much as 60% of that bitumen should be exported to lower cost refineries in the US. This is now a political issue. Uh, we have several different leadership candidates for the Premier of Alberta, and several of them have come out saying, we will not export unupgraded crude. And that has a huge impact in terms of the costs in the oil sands. So this is what a CAPS forecast looks like if we don't import diluents from somewhere else. We'd have a net output of about a million barrels per day of synthetic light oil and 2.6 million barrels per day of, of non-upgraded bitumen. If we build the pipeline and bring 200,000 barrels per day of diluents in from the west coast, we could be exporting 1.6 million barrels per day of synthetic light oil. The pipeline issue, uh, existing and planned pipelines appear adequate to accommodate the achievable output from the oil sands as I see them, but certainly not the forecast. I don't believe that CAP's forecast could possibly be met, but if it was, we need to build about a million barrels per day of new pipeline infrastructure. There are several proposed pipeline projects of which only a few are likely to be built. The gateway project proposed by Enbridge is targeted at overseas exports, not at uh, the US. Shortages of traditional diluents indicate a large proportion of the synthetic light oil will have to be used as a diluent for moving bitumen. These are existing uh, planned and proposed pipelines in Canada. These two will, will likely get built. Uh, Enbridge as gateway pipeline to the coast is, is questionable. And there would be a diluent pipeline returning uh, light oil on the same right away. If we look at CAP's forecast again, uh, if we could achieve that, we're short about 1.2 million barrels per day of capacity without diluent imports. If we bring in diluents, we're short about 1.4 million barrels per day. The water issue, extraction of bitumen by surface and in situ methods uses substantial amounts of water. A lot of that water can be recycled. However, we need about one to two barrels of makeup water for each barrel of oil extracted. Requirements compared to the low flow of the Athabasca River are already significant, let alone forecast 
increases. Utilization of deep formation waters is restricted by salinity. It has to be diluted uh, with surface waters to keep the salinity down. Salinity down. Native bands downstream of the operations on the Athabasca River have we recently withdrawn from the Cumulative Environmental Man Management Association. This was a, an industry aboriginal association looking at an environmental issues. They did this uh, stating that this organization had absolutely no impact on ongoing developments. This is what the existing oil sands looks like. This is part of it. This is a, a 25 kilometer square with huge uh, fine tailings ponds. These, this one here is about three by two kilometers. Those tailings have to sit there for decades. Uh, nobody really knows how long until the fines sail, uh, settle out. I can't imagine what it will look like when we quadruple or quintuple the oil sands. So how much oil can we really get out of the oil sands? If you look at uh, the amount of money that's on the table, the $90 billion, it would appear that we can get less than 2.5 million barrels per day over the forecast period unless we export a lot of it uh, south, as in the cap case, in which case we could get up to 2.8 million barrels per day. Just like to refer to a study that was done at Uppsala University in Sweden. It was published in June. And it looked at uh, no holds barred, no stops. How much can we grow the oil sands, just ignoring everything, assuming all the inputs will be there, uh, a so-called crash program. And they suggested that we may be able to get it up to 5.8 million barrels per day by 2038. A good bit of that will have to be in situ. And the in situ recovery was really the biggest question mark in the Uppsala report. But the other thing they noted is if we could do that, the surface mineable oil sands would be completely gone by 2050. The EIA's forecast of world unconventional oil, this is all of it. Oil sands, biodiesel, ethanol, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, Venezuela, Orinoco. Uh, they suggested that if we can grow that by 539%, unconventional oil could be 9.7% of forecast 2030 demand. Significant, yes, but it's not a panacea to offset conventional oil declines. Energy return on energy investment. Again, I showed you this for gas this morning. As we go down the food chain from very prolific wells in Saudi Arabia to heavy oil, gas to liquids, the energy profit on the energy investment becomes less and less. Tar sands are about one barrel burned for every two barrels uh, recovered. Depending on who you talk to, uh, biodiesel and ethanol are even more marginal uh, sources of fuel and maybe even negative if you believe Pimentel at Cornell University. We also looked at this with reference to gas or this morning. Uh, as we go to lower and lower quality sources of fuels, in this case oil, the in situ resources get very large. The, pro the proportion of those resources that can be recovered at an energy profit becomes smaller and smaller. So even though the in situ number for the oil sands is 1.6 trillion barrels, the 10.2 is a very small proportion of that total. So the issue is not resources. Uh, the resources are huge. It's deliverability. How fast can these or resources be converted into supply in the face of growing demand? And at what cost? We're clearly not running out of oil. There'll be oil in 100 million years. It just won't, won't be recoverable at an energy profit. So in summary, reported huge, huge reserves of unconventional oil are comforting to some, but largely meaningless as a means to offset declines in conventional oil production because of the difficulty in growing deliverability. Huge cost overruns in Canada's oil sands suggest maximum outputs of less than 2.5 million barrels per day with the announced 90 billion of investment, unless much bitumen is upgraded without, or is exported without upgrading, in which case we may be able to get to 2.8 million barrels per day. Issues surrounding inputs for oil sands production include natural gas, water, diluents, capital, pipelines, and politics. 
And all of these add uncertainties to meeting the forecast outputs. Long-term oil sands production forecasts for the 2015-2025 timeframe are not achievable unless these issues are resolved. Thank you very much.